Hey, hermsters. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk about ionic compounds, and ionic compounds are when one atom loses an electron and one atom gains that electron. So let's take a look at sodium and chlorine, and um, let's talk valence electrons first. How many valence electrons does sodium have? One. Yeah, good. Um, what about chlorine? Seven. Seven, good. All right, what's the electronegativity of these? So we have to look at the electronegativity chart. I think it's on page four. Sodium is, I think, 1. No, 0 0.9. Oh, 0 0.9. Okay, cool. Uh, 0.9. And then chlorine is? 3.0. Okay. So when we find the difference of these two, what do we get? 2.1. Yeah, and if you remember that little chart that we have, anything from 0 to 0.3, nonpolar. 0.4 up to 1.9, that's going to be our polar. And then two and above is going to be ionic. All right, so we're above two, so that means it's going to be ionic. All right, so there's going to be a loss or a gain of electrons. All right, what's sodium going to do? Lose or gain? Yeah, it has one. It wants to get rid of one because then it'll be isoelectronic to neon. Um, if chlorine gains one, it's going to be isoelectronic to what? Argon, yeah, you just look at the next one over. So it'll be isoelectronic to argon. So we just kind of show this as an arrow being over there. And then this is, what does it look like afterwards? So sodium will be plus one, because it lost one electron. And then chlorine will have those eight electrons now, and it'll be minus one. All right, so there we go for that one. Any questions with that part? No? All right, let's look at calcium. What's calcium's electronegativity? That one's 1.0? 1 okay. 1.0. And then what about fluorine? That's 4, right? 4.0. Okay. And the difference is 3, right? So this is above 2. It's going to be ionic. All right. Calcium had two valence electrons. Fluorine has 7. All right. What's going to lose? What's going to gain? Calcium's going to lose. Fluorine's going to gain. Why did they draw two fluorines over here? Yeah, because there's still another electron, and this calcium is going to lose it, and it's going to go to another fluorine atom, making that fluoride. All right. So this is what we have for this one. Calcium's going to become plus what? Good. Plus two. All right. Fluorine's going to become minus one. There's two of them. What would the formula look like for this? Good. C A. F2, and what would the name of this be? Calcium yeah, calcium fluoride, right? So we've kind of already done some of this stuff when we talked about nomenclature, right? So now we're just kind of looking at where the electrons are moving specifically for these problems. All right? Any questions with that? The ionic. Yeah? Okay. All right, so what are some characteristics of ionic bonding? Um, nature favors arrangements in which the potential energy is minimized. And we've seen this even with um, covalent bonds. Um, therefore, ions minimize their potential energy by combining in an orderly arrangement known as a crystal lattice. Um, the greater the electronegativity difference, the greater the ionic character. Okay, ionic character is, you can basically think of it as how ionic is a molecule, all right? So if you were to compare ionic character <coughs> between these three things, nonpolar, polar, and ionic, which one do you think would have the highest ionic character? Ionic. Yeah, the ionic one, right? What do you think would have the least ionic character? Nonpolar. Nonpolar, yeah. And there's percentages in all of that. Um, the easiest one would be if it's nonpolar, if it's zero, it's zero percent ionic character. And the easiest one is if it's above 2.0, if it's in this range of ionic, it's 100% ionic character. And the middle ground where it's 50% is somewhere in the middle of polarity, which means polar, because it has those slight charges, it's sort of acting a little ionic. So that's kind of like the range with this. We don't need to know anything more than that for this year. Um, but if it asked you like a question, like what has the highest ionic character, it would be obviously the ionic ones. What had the lowest ionic character, it would be the non-polar. All right. So that's what it's talking about with ionic character in there. 
crystal lattice, this is just talking about its three-dimensional shape. And we're not gonna go into all of the different kinds of three-dimensional shapes. We're just gonna kind of look at a basic pattern um, in here. Okay, so there's um, a crystal lattice, there's attractive forces, and then there's also repulsive forces. Um, so let's just draw a couple um, ions and let's see what happens. Let's make a grid of nine. Okay. This goes on and on and on, all right? That's why it's, just, it's, a, it's a lattice. It just keeps on expanding. Um, and it's three-dimensional also, so it goes off in three dimensions. Um, around each chlorine, how many sodiums are there? Okay, so around each chlorine, how many sodiums? And usually the answer would be four, right? Why is four not 100% correct? Why is six the best answer? Where are the other two? Remember, it's three dimensional. So what's gonna be in front of the board? Sodium. Another sodium. What's gonna be behind the board? Sodium. Another sodium as well. So you have four that you can see here when it's two dimensional, and then there's two more, one in front, one behind it, okay? So that would give us our, our kind of basic crystal lattice, all right? So let's talk about the, the forces. Um, attractive forces, uh, for, for this, forces in lattice formation include opposite charges. So this chlorine's attracted to that sodium because they're opposite charges. That makes sense. Another thing that's attractive is the nuclei, which is what charge? What charge is the nucleus always? Yeah, it's always positive. All right, so the nucleus is gonna be attracted to electrons because electrons are always negatively charged, right? Each of these has a nucleus, right? And each of these has electrons. So no matter what, the nucleus of one is going to be attracted to electrons of the others. So you're going to get that attraction in there as well. All right. Now, what's forcing them to kind of not be stable or want to break apart? The repulsive forces. So same charge ions. So if you look diagonally, there's negatives here, right? So those are going to want to be away from each other. The sodium, same thing. The positives are going to want to be away from each other. And then also, there is a ton of electrons in here. So all the electrons don't want to be near each other e either. So that's going to be the other repulsive force that we're going to talk about in here. Does that make sense? So there, it's, a, it's really complicated as far as why they stay together. If this was on Facebook, it wouldn't be single. It wouldn't be in a relationship. It would be, it's complicated, right? Yeah, it's, that joke's not going to age well. <laughs> all right, so lattice energy. Um, it's just the strength of the ionic bonds. Some of them are stronger, some of them are weaker. Um, that's what we're talking about with lattice energy. Um, and then there's comparing covalent and ionic. So the attraction between molecules and covalent is much weaker than the attraction between formula units. So I want to be specific on what we're talking here. So if I was to draw a water molecule and then another water molecule, what are the attractive forces between these two water molecules? What do you think? Hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond, right? Because the oxygen is slightly negative, the hydrogen is slightly positive, so there's a hydrogen bond between those two, right? So that's what it's talking about here, the attraction between molecules. So it's talking about this attraction right here, um, and then it's saying it's much weaker than the attraction between formula units, which would be that whole NaCl, NaCl, you know, if we have this big pattern of them just repeating. So this attraction is going to be much stronger, all right? That's what it's talking about there. It's not talking about the covalent bond within a molecule, okay? It's just talking about between molecules here, all right? All right, so this causes ionic compounds to have a higher melting point, um, and also a higher boiling point, and they're also um, stronger, all right? Um, if you think about certain bonds, this would be like ice, ice, ice holding together would be a hydrogen bond there, um, as opposed to like a crystal of salt, all right? Okay, ionic compounds are brittle because even slightly moving a layer of those atoms would cause a shift that would put the same 
charge ions next to each other, this repulsion would cause them to break. So when we made our alum crystals, if you drop them on the ground, they would shatter because of one little shift. Can you imagine if you dropped this on this part right on the ground and that caused it to shift by one atom, what the rest of it would, would do? Then you would have this chloride would be next to this chloride. This sodium would be next to that sodium, right? So you'd have a lot of the same charges there and that would cause it to, to break, all right? And that's what they're talking about there, all right, that's shifting. Okay, ionic compounds can conduct electricity um, two ways. One, if you dissolve them in water, which we're gonna do a lab on this next week um, and go over conductivity, um, or you could melt them down which is very difficult. That's not adding water. That's actually raising their temperature to 1,000 degrees Celsius or whatever their melting point is. Um, that's very difficult to do. We're not gonna do that in lab because it's kind of like you know lava, that kind of a thing. Um, that's kind of the, the molten, if you think of it that way. Um, we'll dissolve it in water because we can do that very easily. Uh, the water dissolves the crystal, therefore allowing those ions to move. This result um, allows the current to flow through the water because the current electricity needs those ions to be able to move through there. Um, the molten state does the, basically the same thing. The ions are free to move. So you could think of that as um, it would be able to conduct electricity as well. Right? But again, we're not doing that. Um, some facts about covalent compounds. They conduct electricity poorly. Um, they have the lower melting points and um, boiling points than ionic compounds. So if it's nonpolar, its melting point is going to be up to 260 degrees Celsius, and then if it's polar, the uh, you know up to about 400. Why do you think polar would have a higher melting point? Why do you think it would be harder to melt polar molecules or to boil polar molecules as opposed to nonpolar? Yeah, Jacob. Yeah, they have a higher energy because of the attraction between their molecules, right? So they they have hydrogen bonds. So they're gonna be more attracted to each other. If you don't have hydrogen bonds, they're not gonna hold, hold as easily, all right? Um, and again, they're, it's just weaker than ionic, all right? Um, then there's these metallic bonds, and metallic bonds have delocalized mobile electrons. So these electrons can move freely. They can move wherever they kind of like to, um, and that's why electricity moves very, very efficiently through metal. Um, that's why wires are made out of metal, because you can send electrons through them very easily. And that's all electricity is. It's just moving electrons. Um, alloys are mixtures of metals. Does anybody know any, um, oh, it's Valentine's Day. Any examples of alloys you could get as a gift? Steel, Steel yeah, it's a very romantic <laughs> alloy. Yeah, it's made out of carbon and a whole bunch of iron and some other stuff. Brass. Brass, yeah, all right, we're getting warmer. Good, brass, that's a good one. What else? Any other alloys? Sterling silver is actually an alloy. Does anybody know what it's made up of? Silver, yes, you're right. What's the other part? <laughs> is that on the periodic table? No, it's copper, it's a mixture. You have a copper, copper in there. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, so there's some examples of alloys. Um, amalgams, um, they're actually alloys, but they're mixed with mercury. So this would be things like um, old fillings they used to use for um, cavities and whatnot. Um, that would be an example. Um, also, some other fun facts about metals and why we like them for jewelry is they're shiny. All right, they're shiny, we like that. Why are they shiny? Now this gets into the physics stuff we were talking about before. They absorb light and then they re-admit um, it, you know, the photons, they'll re-admit it slightly um, different wavelength and that gives us that, that shine. Um, which is pretty awesome, all right? And then two words that I know you know from middle school. Does anybody remember? What was malleable? What was malleable? Yeah, Brent? It's able to be hammered into sheets. Yeah, exactly, you can hammer it into sheets. Good, what about ductile? Yeah. Made into a wire, yeah, exactly. Does anybody know any real world examples of something that's made malleable for you? Aluminum foil, right? Yeah, exactly, aluminum foil. Perfect, what about anything ductile? Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, copper would be one, like copper wires, you know, that kind of stuff for electricity or like speakers and that kind of thing. 